Hello, everyone. Welcome to Front Page Esports. Alongside Frank Salerno, I'm Rob Flax. And before we get into the esports news of the week, it would be inappropriate not to acknowledge the issues on the forefront of public discussion in our country and, frankly, the world right now. Yeah, Rob, it is completely unjust that in the year 2020, people of color in the United States are unsafe and are treated unfairly due to systemic racism. It is impossible for Rob and I, as two white men, to truly understand the hardships that African Americans and all people of color are challenged by and the prejudices that they face every single day. But what we do know is that everyone is accountable to educate themselves and each other. Every day as a community, we can help take steps in the right direction, ensuring that nobody is silent on the issues of racism and inequality, and making sure that people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor are honored with immense and necessary change, not only in the United States, but around the world. Tying it back to our program here, we wanted to take the first segment of this show to look at how the gaming and esports industry has responded to the recent protests and public discussion. Many video game companies have spoken out on the issue with statements within their games themselves. When loading into Call of Duty and Apex Legends matches, for example, you can find a loading screen with a statement in support of Black Lives Matter. Some games like NBA 2K and GTA 5 shut down access to online servers for a few hours as a symbolic virtual moment of silence in honor of George Floyd. Madden delayed its Madden 21 announcement. PlayStation delayed its PS5 gameplay reveal. Call of Duty dele delayed the release of Season 4 and this past weekend's Call of Duty League event. And much more has happened from gaming companies all in support of Black Lives Matter and the ongoing pro protests for racial equality. But these steps are frankly not enough. In too many games and in their communities, people of color or anyone who is not a straight white male do not feel safe from harassment and voice chat hateful names and clan tags, and stereotyped, appropriated cultural depictions. At this very moment, the top post on the Valorant subreddit is about being unable to speak in the voice chat without being mercilessly harassed and threatened as a woman of color and a player of the game. This is unacceptable, and it needs to change. And even in the companies and publishers who create these games, their internal cultures are far from perfect, with histories of discrimination and harassing workers, specifically workers of color, as well as donating to the organizations that work against BIPOC interests. Just today, a senior executive at Riot Games is under investigation for sharing a conspiracy post on Facebook about the death of George Floyd, arguing that his lifestyle was the reason for his death. And while he is under investigation, and that is commendable, it's worth noting that a senior executive in a globally traded company thought that he could post this type of content and not expect any sort of internal or personal reprimand. And too often, the internal changes that these companies do endeavor on are reactive. They're not the baseline. And they're there to cover after negative press and bad practices are made public. We should demand better from these companies because we want this industry to be better, to be more inclusive and diverse. And we should expect that diverse voices, when they are included in the discussion and at all aspects of these companies, are actually heard when they raise grievances and are respected when they offer their opinions and decisions made by them should be honored by these companies. There's still a lot of work to be done and it needs to be done going forward as a new normal and not just when there's a huge public spotlight actively demanding it. We here at Front Page Esports will be using our platform and our privilege to shine a light on these shortcomings we see and call for the changes that we think should happen. That is the choice that we are making and we hope that in a small part it could lead to a more inclusive industry. And to be clear, to turn a blind eye to racism, xenophobia, and discrimination and harassment in the companies that create the games and in the products themselves is a choice. Turning a blind eye is an active choice. And in the end, our choices make us. This is the end of the discussion for today, but certainly not for good. And we hope it will spark discussions amongst everybody in the gaming community about the changes that need to be made going forward. These changes are overdue. We hope they take place. And with that, back to the show. Okay, Rob, now for some of the biggest stories from the past two weeks. Obviously, we missed last week. So we wanted to catch you up on some of the biggest stories that happened, being that this is from Page Esports. Some of this news is a little bit older, but like, like I said, we, we thought it was important to share with you. So first things first, Valorant, probably the most talked about esport right now. Some big news coming out of that game, Rob. What's going on? Absolutely. The game actually officially made it out of beta and is a released product in name. It's out, it was at patch 1.0 and now at patch 1.1, where change is focusing on maps, sight lines, and certain character abilities just to keep the game fair, keep the game fun, and really try to keep it as an esports ready game that is fair, fun to play, 
and has a lot of elements that aren't going to give one side an advantage that could be, you know, something you could work around if it's just a game you're playing with your friends, but as a competitive sport would really need to be worked around. And also going back to uh, actual the eSports side of it, the competitive scene seems to be poaching players from the Counter-Strike scene. Yeah. Both Skadoodle and Hiko were both drafted to Team Skadoodle to uh, SK Telecom T1 and Hiko T100 Thieves, respectively. And it's interesting that they're actually just poaching talent from Counter-Strike teams, and it's interesting that they're going along with it. Sometimes games will be floating offers and contracts to players from other games just to try to bring some attention to theirs, but it's interesting that they're actually taking it, and so maybe they're looking at Counter-Strike, they're looking at that scene and they're saying, you know what, we've seen what Riot can do with League of Legends, we, these are guys who knows how to, know how to build an esports scene, and they're saying, you know what, this is the path for my career, and Frank, we're going to see if other people join them, and if they do, it's going to be a real interesting scene to watch, and really, I can't wait to watch my first Valorant tour. Yeah, I was actually listening to the 100 Thieves had a podcast where they had Hiko on talking about joining the team and what, what he was talking about, what players from what different games are kind of the best at Valorant right now. And he said that Counter-Strike Go players, they just have a mechanical advantage right now over other, other games. Obviously, a lot of these competitive players at the highest level have really good game sense, but mechanically, the game just has really similar similarity, should I say to Counter-Strike. So those players kind of have an advantage right now, and he thinks they will go away over time. But for now, just seeing the Counter-Strike players um, coming over to Valorant and making that switch just makes the most sense, I think. Um, going on to another game now, um, as players are getting signed, some players are retiring. And in Call of Duty, they saw the GOAT of Call of Duty retire. Karma, who was now on the Seattle Surge, formerly of Optic Gaming, uh, won world championships with three of them with Optic, Oh, sorry, one of them with Optic, but three overall. One with Farico Impact and one with Complexity. He retired from competitive play in Call of Duty, uh, the only three-time world champion. He was a member of the Seattle Surge, who were underperforming this year. And after a couple years of struggling for Karma himself, he decided to hang up the sticks. But a great career for Karma. Like I said, he's re widely regarded as the greatest player of all time in the Call of Duty competitive scene. And the best of luck to him going forward on whatever it is he decides to do with his career. I think he'll make a great coach somewhere. These great players, I mean, if they're not, they don't have the skill anymore to be a competitive player, they can easily be a great coach for any team who really wants it. Absolutely, Frank. And another big high-profile name retired, this time from League of Legends, is UZI from the Chinese team Royal Never Give Up. Now, UZI was known in the community as the best bot laner, maybe one of the best bot laners in the world in terms of his mechanics with attack damage carries, which is one of the major roles and one of the most impactful roles in League of Legends. In fact, in Hyatt Competitive, they are the only source of damage on their entire team, and it's really up to them to carry their teams, all about positioning, all about being able to see incoming threats and respond to them, and he's now retiring. He's actually citing an injury as a result of his retirement, carpal tunnel syndrome, and uh, elbow issues as a result of the high level of movement and high level of stress he was putting on those muscles by playing the game. Uh, Royal Never Give Up is the team he had the most seasons with, and they were actually able to make it to the World's Championship Finals and getting into those rounds probably more than most teams would hope to dream of in the entire franchise history. And unfortunately, uh, when he was drafted by uh, GCD, his contract did expire, but apparently going back to news off of Daily Dot, he was planning on retirement anyway, and the GCD contract was just something he was mulling to see if he could recover. He could not, and so now he's announcing his retirement, but quite a career to look back on. Yeah, I mean, both these, these players, obviously, great players, great careers to look back on, and players that people will never forget. They obviously are going to leave a long legacy on the games they played. All right, Rob, that's all the time we have for this week's Storm Page Esports. Make sure to follow Citrus TV Entertainment on Instagram and at Citrus TV E on Twitter for more content from us and Citrus TV Entertainment as a whole. For Rob Flax, I'm Frank Salerno. Have a good day, everybody.